Hi John, lovely to have you here. You've been in Hong Kong for a year, how have you found it? I absolutely love it. There is so much diversity in the markets that we work in. Uh, just small uh, changes in geographic, say from Hong Kong into China, brings very, very different results in the sites that are popular, what clients are thinking about. Um, it's been a great experience and kind of quickly learning to get smart on a wildly complex and diverse area. John, Asia is a huge market, but there must be huge differences between the regions. Anyone that has developed a social media plan for Asia is misguided. We need a market by market plan, which is actually, I think, really interesting. I, you know, coming from the United States, the idea that you could get on a plane from Washington and f fly five hours or six hours to Los Angeles. The same networks were uh, irrelevant for both markets, the same search engines. The internet is very much the same from one coast to the other in the United States. In Asia, that same five hour plane ride could get you as far north as, say, Tokyo, down to Malaysia. Uh, or Vietnam, and the idea is that these markets are fundamentally different. Uh, an example is we d did some work in Taipei, and if you ask uh, our guys in Taipei to bring up the most influential uh, blogger that, that you follow, or what's the most influential space online in, in Taiwan, uh, they will close down Firefox, they'll X out of Internet Explorer, get down Chrome, and instead go to start, and they will run a telnet powered BBS uh, community, which is just an amazing thing to watch to see how this has evolved in, in Taiwan. And, and when we looked at it, at that point in time, it was 7 o'clock at night, and we looked and I said, really, this old 1980 style BBS is, is the most influential? And there were 58,000 people online at that very point of time. If you go to Vietnam and ask the same question, guys, I, I don't speak Vietnamese, but I would love just to look at the sites that are important here. Bring up some of the influencers that we're working with. Uh, if we're doing something in, say, skincare, give me the, the beauty influencers that people read the most. They'll take you to Facebook pages. And at first it's kind of confusing because you think, no, I, I want to look at the bloggers. Who are the real influencers? And they'll tell you, no, it's, it's, it's all, some of the top influencers are on Facebook. And it's this evolution. It's this like Darwin idea where these different markets have evolved differently. In Vietnam, for example, they never had the years of, say, WordPress or Blogger or TypePad platforms to help fuel blogging. It's gone from essentially nothing and leapfrogged 10 years of blogging platforms directly to a Facebook blogging platform. And there are these great examples of this evolution, kind of leapfrogging one another. Mobile is a great example. You have markets like Indonesia and, and India that have gone to essentially no connectivity to mobile banking without the 15 years of internet banking that you or I may be used to, used to dealing with. So the changes are really, really incredible. John, in that time, how have you found digital influence, DI, evolving? Um, that's a good question. I think we see it evolving in a few different ways. I think, the, I think the thing that we're witnessing the most, and perhaps we're in the earliest phase of this, is l watching the progression of social media moving from a marketing and communications discipline to something that's at the core of the business. For a lot of our clients, we're no longer simply just collecting brand mentions. What are people saying on a really popular BBS in China? What are people saying about us on Facebook in Malaysia? Instead, it's looking at ways that we can make our clients a more social business. And we do that by an, a number of different ways, and we're evolving the ways that we can both develop programs and also listen to what people are saying and help improve our products and our services. So that, I think, is a big change, the idea that we're becoming not only just a marketing communications discipline, but helping or, uh, organizations figure out how do we structure ourselves around social media? Is there a way that the product development and the social media team and the customer service team can all kind of come together under a common kind of center? Uh, so that, I think, has been one of the biggest uh, progressions or evolutions that we're likely to see continue. And John, what mistakes are you seeing companies making? I think one of the things that we've seen, and this is true in the U.S. and it's true in Asia, is uh, not being transparent or not being authentic. Uh, making sure that we've got a clear guidelines for employees. So what are things that people that work at our company can say about us or their products? And what are things that are off limits? Uh, is, uh, is a common, I think, mistake because we see a lot of times of uh, employees kind of taking free reign and it's clear that there's not much in terms of a policy for social media for a lot of our clients. One of the other things that we see as a common mistake is this idea of zombie efforts. 
and these zombie efforts are pages or sites that we create in social media based on the idea of doing a campaign. On Facebook, for example, we create a Facebook page uh, and then the campaign is over and the Facebook page is this kind of living thing, but it's dead in reality. Nobody's maintaining it. It's alive, but it's just this zombie page that uh, people are asking questions on or fans of, but nobody from the brand is actually responding. And the danger there is getting into this campaign mentality. Using social media for a single one-off campaign is probably one of the most common mistakes that we see. And the solution to that is getting into a more long-term investment. The idea that we would create something in Facebook and then turn it off is just counter to the idea of building connections with people long term. So using it as a campaign tool is probably one of the most common mistakes that we see. Companies have got to change their tra traditional structures a little bit, don't they? Because they've got to be able to trust that their employees can talk on their behalf. Yeah, absolutely, and that comes, uh, that's part of, of, a, of a, the critical need for a training program to make sure that other parts of the company are trained up to use social media. There's been some great examples of brands in Asia that have used their employees to help become customer service agents. In a way, social media is forcing a lot of our clients to have every employee, no matter what the job title, be a customer service agent. And that, I think, has been a really interesting thing to see progress. So we have people that are on the product teams, people that are you know, behind the curtain in the engineering you know, department, whatever it may be, responding to people's questions in social media. And that's been, I think, a great benefit for us as customers, but it's also been a great benefit for brands. We see a lot of our brands now asking us to not create monitoring reports or listening posts, simply just to listen to what br the brand mentions are. That's kind of a commodity. The idea of doing monitoring reports for brands, we, that, that's, I think, a kind of a well thought out and well developed field. We can, almost any agency can do that. What we're seeing more and more of is brands asking us, don't give me a list of links of people that have mentioned my client or product uh, in social media. Instead, I want to use social media to inform the way that we develop our products. And what that means is that we're looking and we're using social media as an early indicator for shifts in trends. The way that people talk about fashion, the way that they view the automotive industry, the way that they think about fuel efficiency, whatever the topic may be. And so it's not a brand mention, it's, the hypothesis is social media is a precursor to major behavioral shifts with our consumers. And so what we're using then is that research is going not necessarily just to the marketing team within a client, but straight to the product development the guys that are designing the cars, the guys that are cutting the shirts at a fashion company, and figuring out how social media can inform product development. Given that Australia has such a small population, what numbers do you need to actually determine whether a trend is a trend? Sure, so, so I think what's interesting is in Australia is that we don't quite have the, the long tail that we may have in a bigger market like the UK or the US, uh, where we have very, very small niche populations. But what we have found is that there's a few different models of influence. There's a model of influence that says the one, one, out, one person out of 10 influences the other nine. There's another model of influence that says it's actually not necessarily so important to get to that one influencer, but the network itself, the network like say Facebook, is a facilitator of ideas and information. And building a community, even if it's just 5,000 fans of your brand online, is a really important driver. And even in a market like say Australia where the population is lower, you still have those really powerful connections between the brand uh, and its fans or its uh, followers online. Well, John, I hope you enjoy your time in Australia, and thanks very much for joining us. Sure, thank you.